Uh, thanks a lot to Raf. Uh, he'll be talking to us about interpreting prediction markets. Um, uh, over to you. Thank you. All right. So I'm Raf Angelo. This is um, we're gonna gonna tell you about an interesting little problem that we we ran into in I interpreting prediction markets. Uh, this is joint work with Nikete de la Pena and Mark Reed. And I, uh, I got into this problem while I was visiting them at ANU at NICTA. Um, so just a recap on the, the prediction market model. So I'll just use this running example um, of the US election. Um, so just consider a, a prediction market where there, there are two contracts. There's a, an election, let's ignore the third candidate, which is probably what's going to happen anyway. Um, and you offer two contracts, one that says, I'll, I'll give you a dollar if Obama wins, and the other, I'll give you a dollar if Romney wins. And you, you open up a market, and you allow, allow traders to buy and sell these contracts. And in fact, the, the prices will fluctuate as the demand changes. And you can see that the prices always have to be less than one, because at most, you can get one from these contracts. And actually, um, they have to sum to one, because if they didn't, um, if they sum to less than one, then you could guarantee a, a dollar profit by buying two contracts, which sum to less than one. And similarly, for selling when they're summed to greater than one. So somehow we're getting a probability vector out of these prices. And the prices should somehow, the theory says, reflect a consensus estimate of the population. So the, of, the, of the underlying probability that, um, of which candidate should win. And the question that we're sort of going to explore is, what, what is this consensus estimate, really? And in particular, can we express this in terms of the traders' beliefs? So if you look at the standard theory of prediction markets, well, you know, the, it says, well, if traders have unbounded wealth and they're risk neutral, then the best thing to do is to just set the, to buy and buy or sell until the prices exactly match the probabilities that you have. That that action maximizes your expected um, reward. And if this last trader was paying attention, and you know, looking at what everyone else was doing and doing a proper Bayesian update to aggregate everyone's information then they would have the correct posterior of everyone's beliefs. But obviously, these are ridiculous assumptions in general. Um, not only, obviously, unbounded wealth, but risk neutrality is also not really observed in betting that much. And you know, it's very debatable whether Bayesian updating can, is even possible. So it's not quite satisfying. So there's this um, other bit of work that looks at the standard equilibrium analysis, which, which Adrian um, mentioned in his talk. So in this setting, they looked at a distribution of traders' beliefs. So um, I'll just use the running example of a binary market. So suppose you just you had some distribution over the beliefs that Obama was going to win the election. So some distribution between 0 and 1. Um, and you fix some price, pi. Of, of the Obama contract, say. And then you ask, what is the total demand at this price for that contract? And you say the equilibrium price is just the price where supply equals demand, which in this case just means that the total number of buys for the Obama contract equals the sells. But because of our peculiar setting here, actually a, a buy for, or sorry, um, a, a sell for an Obama contract is the same as a buy for Romney. So if you want to, suppose I didn't let you sell any contracts, just buy, and you wanted to go short in an Obama contract, it would be the same thing as buying a Romney contract. So another way to express this supply equals demand is you want the equilibrium price such that an equal number of contracts on either side are purchased. So there, there are two papers that look at this. Uh, the first is by Mansky in 2004. And he considered risk-neutral traders and found that the equilibrium price in this setting was equal to some quantile of the distribution. So I'll just very quickly go over the argument. So um, 
on the, the left-hand side of the equation, say that the pi is the price for the Obama contract, the left-hand side is the equation is the demand for Romney contracts, the other event. So you can see that if your belief that Obama is going to win is actually less than the current price, then you're better off buying the other contract. And the, the total mass is just the, the integral of this distribution up until pi star. And say everyone has wealth one, then they purchase one over one minus pi star of those contracts. This is the total number of shares for Romney. So the price, the price is summed to one. So the price of the Romney contract is, is one minus pi star. And similarly, um, if the price is above your belief, then, um, I'm sorry, did I say that wrong? Anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I may have gotten a, a sign wrong, but essentially if, on the flip side, the, the contracts cost pi and um, you integrate the other side of the distribution. If you work it out, then you get this peculiar quantile which says that the number of, tra the, the total mass of the traders with belief above pi star um, is equal to pi star. Yeah, yeah, I, I had that right. So you get this peculiar quantile. And, and Wolfers and Zitowitz in 2006 followed this up and they weren't quite satisfied with this weird quantile and they found that if you look at Kelly betters, which are essentially betters that have log utility, then their demands are actually a linear function in the belief. And so if you carry out the same analysis, because it's now linear in the belief, the equilibrium price is going to be the mean of this distribution, P. Why is it linear in the belief? Um, do you, the, the simple answer is that there's a P that appears as a, do you want to like a philosophical some, answer? Or? So you solve some maximization problem and then you get a yeah, function. Yeah, if you, yeah. Solve, if you solve max expected utility, for example. Yeah, so I think this is similar to the linear betting functions that. Uh, constant betting functions. I'm sorry, constant betting functions. Okay, I'm not quite sure why it's constant, but we can talk about that afterwards. It's okay. not constant, it's constant in the amount you spend, but the point is that. I see, and I'm talking about contracts. Okay, so because I'm talking about contracts and not the amount of money, I see, I see. So uh, just a quick question, does Matsky mm -hmm. generalize this to more than two, because I can see quantiles I don't, in two cases, but you know, when you get more generally, it's really I don't think so. Specify that. There's a yeah. Like, right. tries to generalize it, but you have to make yeah. some additional assumptions. It's, it's a pretty strong. painful computation once you get yeah. to more, and I just want to listen to that. Yeah. I think his point was he was kind of um, being the anti to this. He, was, he, mm. he wanted to make a kind of negative point. Sorry. Sorry. It just doesn't make any sense to the prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Wolfer's papers follows up and says, well, actually, you know, if you have more reasonable traders, it, it becomes more reasonable. Um, but we're actually going to, <laughs> to bring this whole this whole approach in the question. And, you know, if you look at some markets, it's not quite clear where the equilibrium is. Um, and this, this is actually the, I think it's the GOP uh, primary election in the US, which was particularly crazy this time. And, you know, when you look at things like this, it's not immediately clear how to use these prices to make predictions. Uh, and th the equilibrium doesn't necessarily pop out. So, no, this was sort of our motivation. We, we took instead a, a stochastic approach. And this is actually based on a paper by Othman and Sandholm. And they looked at a sequential market. So instead of this equilibrium analysis where you, you set a price and ask for all the demands, it's, it's more the, the market maker kind of setting where you have a sequential market. And we're going to sample traders from our belief distribution one at a time and ask them to trade in the market. And the, the prices are going to now adjust to each trade. So according to the demand, the prices will, will fluctuate slightly. And we're going to use an automated market maker. So our model is, is the model of Abernathy, Chen, and Vaughn in 2011. So I'll briefly go over this again for those of you who are at the tutorial. It was probably much clearer then. Um, so we'll, we'll just look at n mutually exclusive events. 
and you have some convex cost function C, which is going to determine the prices. And you're going to keep track of, the market maker keeps track of the total number of contracts that have been sold in each, for each outcome. And I'll call that Q. So now if, when, when, the price, um, when the shares are at Q, if someone comes in and asks for demand D of some bundle D where DI is how much they want for contract I, that's going to cost them this difference in the potential function C, essentially between the new quantity vector and the old quantity vector. And the, the prices here, where did the prices go? Well, the prices are sort of the derivative of this function at the current quantity. And you can see this by thinking about buying an infinitesimal amount and looking at the price per share of that amount. And that'll, that'll get you the derivative. So just as an example of some way to do this that you've seen, think about the exponential weights algorithm where if you keep buying one contract, the price is going to go up according to the soft max. And you know, the prices will adjust to try to match the demand. So we're going to think about general demand functions, which are sort of similar to these betting functions. But like we observed, it's the demands are actually how many contracts you want to buy, not how much money you're going to spend. So we're just going to consider wealth drawn from some distribution W. The current price is pi and the, the belief. So the wealth and the belief are from the trader and the, the prices are from the market. And again, DI is the demand for contract I. And so the full model is you, you draw a trader IID from your distribution. You ask them what their demand is for the current prices, pi t. And then the price adjusts according to this gloriously simple update. Um, basically, what's going on here is you take the current prices and you ask, what is, the, what is a quantity vector that would have led to these prices? So that's the um, gradient of C inverse. And then you add the demand to that and then ask what the price is at that point. So if, if this is not quite clear, it was. So you wrote this in mirrored Zen form because you're going to. Hey. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this is the, there's no other way to write the price update, right? I mean, you could write it as an argument of something, but it, I think it's a very natural way to express it. You just, you ask what the current prices are, you map that to the quantity vector, add the demand, and then ask what the new price is. It's just a bit weird because the gradient of C may not be an invertible function. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, it turns out the, the cost function C should be invariant to adding the ones vector. So if you buy one of any, every contract, that shouldn't change the prices. So the quantity vector might be off by some factor of the ones vector, but when you add the demand and ask for the current price, that computation also is invariant to the, the same thing. So the first question that we ask is, what is the, the fixed point of our process? We have some stochastic process. What is its fixed point? And by that, I mean, what, what prices pi t satisfy that the expected update stays the same? So the expected value of the next prices are actually equal to the, the current prices. Some, this is some notion of equilibrium, but obviously it's, it's a very different notion. And we'll define this point, the stationary point, to be pi s. And basically in the, in the paper, we assume enough about the demand so that this is unique. Um, now, a natural question of these two sort of notions of of equilibrium is how do they relate. And Othman and Sandholm actually look at this question. They had, they considered a binary market, again, with risk neutral traders. And they had each trader invest some infinitesimal amount at a time, and also randomly sampled the same model. And they found that actually these two prices are equal in this model. So you get, somehow you get the same notion of, of equilibrium. And we asked, well, is this, is this a general phenomenon? Can we get this out of our more general model with these you know, general demand functions? And um, one of our main results is that for these very general demands, in fact, if you take the wealth, take the limit as the wealth go to zero, then these two prices 
coincide. Uh, this is for general demands. So we have a very general class of demand functions. Basically, all we require is that um, you can't go broke. So you, you can't, um, if you have a wealth W, you can't invest so much so that there's some state of the world that you will lose your money and some basic monotonicity properties that if the price goes up, you'll buy less and things like that. But ver very basic, you know, general things and, and we still get this. So it is, in, in that sense, a very general phenomenon. And if you plug in, if you plug in the risk neutral traders, you, you get their result as a corollary. So if that's true, you've then also solved a computation of general equilibrium. Well, it's not quite general because it, it only, I mean, this is particular to prediction markets. So, right. I mean, you could, you could definitely ask, you know, in a general Fisher or Edinburgh market, that kind of setting, does this still hold? Right. Um, but in prediction markets? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, and there's, there's one more caveat, which is um, we've used the same demands for both settings, but that actually doesn't quite make sense. So in the, in the equilibrium setting, you have basically a fixed price. You know, the, the auctioneer asks a fixed price and says, how much, how much do you want for that price? But in the market maker setting, the price is sort of moving under your feet as you buy. So if you say, what, how much do you want given that I'm going to charge you this potential? versus how much do you want, given that I'm only going to charge you the derivative of the potential, these should be different demand functions. So we kind of cheated a little bit in this result. Um, I'm not sure it's clear. This is sort of an important point. So if this is not clear, let me know. It's sort of why you need the W to go to zero. Yeah, in a sense, yeah. You, you, you want the wealth to go to zero, because then the, you can approximate your cost function by a linear function, basically. Um, so it's, it's an open question on how to make this work for the more sensible demands. Basically, you want some, like maybe a utility-based demand function where it makes sense to ask both of these questions, how much do you want in each setting? And I, I, think, I think it should still work out. So on to some um, interactions with machine learning. So there's a, a Chen and Vaughn paper from 2009 that, that compares the market maker setting to follow the regularized leader, an algorithm from machine learning, online learning. So I'll just quickly review that algorithm. So you have these losses, loss vectors, so linear losses, and some action space, let's say it's uh, the simplex. So you choose some probability distribution. You could think of this as the experts algorithm or something. You, you choose a, a distribution over experts, and you have some some regularizer R, some convex function over distributions. And the way you choose the next distribution is you, you choose the, the distribution that does the best on the previous losses, but also you add this convex function to it to sort of smooth, smooth out this optimization. Um, and then the, the goal is to minimize the regret, which is, which is this term, which is just the performance that that you had, the, the loss that you suffered during the process, which is the first term. And then the second term is the best expert in some sense. So the loss of the best expert. So the difference between these two is your regret. And Chen and Vaughn showed that, in fact, the market maker update is exactly the same as this update. So the updates are the same. You're choosing, by which I mean that the market is choosing prices in the same way that the F of the follow the regularized leader is choosing distributions. But one thing that doesn't quite match up is the final loss terms. So first I have the regret, which I just showed. And the second term, the, the second line is the, the gain from the market maker. So, um, so, so what is this? The, basically, the, the cost, the, sorry, the revenue of the market maker is these differences in potentials. So at each, each trade, a trader gives you the difference in the potential between the next quantity vector and the previous one. And you can see that at the end, therefore, all these things telescope. And the amount of money that the market maker has gained in the process is just the difference between the C evaluated at the final quantity and C at the beginning. So that's how much the market maker gains 
And then the second term is how much the market maker has to pay out in the worst case. So you look at how many contracts have been given out, and the worst case is that the one that you gave out the most is the one you have to pay for, because they're each worth a dollar. So that's the second term. And these terms don't quite add up, because you have this sum of linear things, and, and you have difference in potential. And in fact, um, you can imagine that if the quantity vector ended up at zero for some reason, then actually these term, these could be arbitrarily off by like a factor of capital T, the, the number of rounds. But we observe that actually, if you look at our fixed price setting where, so I haven't quite described this yet, but suppose the market maker cannot charge you the difference in potentials. Um, suppose the market maker instead has to put up prices and say, you can buy or sell whatever you want at this price, and only after you're done, I'm going to update the prices. Then actually, both the, both the updates and the, the losses match up in these two settings, which is to say that, um, that they're exactly the, the same process. So an observation from machine learning theory is that if the losses are gradients of some function, then actually follow the regularized leader is mirror descent. As, as Jake alluded to earlier. And in fact, if they're stochastic gradients, so if there's some randomness, this psi term, or psi, sorry, then you get stochastic mirror descent. And our, our second result is just basically a combination of these observations. It's just if your demands happen to be gradients, then all that's going on in the hood here is stochastic mirror descent, which is kind of surprising, but not as surprising as, as if you follow the sort of the path between these, these relationships. So a quick application of this is if, if your demands are Kelly betters, then you can write the demands as a gradient of KL divergence, as it turns out. And therefore, the stochastic model, our stochastic model where you have Kelly betters, what's going on is it's just a, a stochastic mirror descent of KL divergence between the current prices and the mean belief of the market, which is a really nice way to think about what could be going on. And it, in a sense, it, it generalizes Wolfers and Zitzewitz by describing what's going on off equilibrium. It's trying to get to this equilibrium point, and it describes sort of how it's getting there. So let me just quickly wrap up with some thoughts about future directions. So, there are standard optimization guarantees for stochastic mirror descent, and you don't have to read all that. The point I want to make is that they're typically done using the average, average point of your iterate, the average iterate. So this sort of suggests that maybe if you're trying to predict, predict something from prediction markets, interpret prediction markets, maybe a sensible thing to do when there's a lot of fluctuation is to look at the average price, because there are sort of guarantees about the optimization. And in particular, for, I mean, this is a completely made up example, but um, <laughs> um, so don't take this with a grain of salt. But if you ever see a market like this, you might want to think about averaging the prices to get a prediction out of it. I completely made it up. But it, I mean. Did you ask about that last night? No, no, no. This is not what I asked you about. No. Um, this, this is actually, this is just generated from. Some, it's a very reasonable example, don't get me wrong. It's a very reasonable example. Um, just, just from coin flips, people, yeah, I can talk about it offline. Um, so just some quick future directions. So obviously, as I mentioned, we'd like to get some more sensible demands for our, our first statement about stationarity. We'd like demands that make sense in a, a fixed price setting and in this continuous price setting. Um, to, to, I guess, a, a class of two sets of demands. Um, also, it's sort of interesting to think about how learning rates relate to liquidity. And maybe if, you know, typically learning rates sort of decay with time, and perhaps you want liquidity, which is sort of the inverse of the learning rate, to increase with time. And perhaps understanding this relationship could help us you know, know how to set our liquidity of our market so that in some sense the market converges. Um, 
and also, obviously, we'd like to try it on real market data. Um, that's it. Thanks. The questions. So, if you let's say you are in like in train, mm -hmm. would, could you use your um, method to? Well, it's sort of a question of how prices are actually predicted now. Um, we didn't really get a clear answer on that, but I think a lot of people take like the final prices or the prices at a fixed time before the, to analyze the predictive power, obviously you can't take that last price because it's, you know, probably the market closes just after the information is actually revealed. So, you know, there's some, some problem there, but um, if you take the prices like, you know, an hour before the outcome was actually revealed. If you use that, then obviously there's some, going to be some variance, but so it, we'd suggest that you should actually take a time average near that point, something like that. Um, we haven't tried it on intrade data, but a lot of these markets aren't fluctuating enough to really have this make sense. Um, yeah. Um. Can you, you, you spoke towards the end about uh, adjusting the step size of this to catch mm -hmm. mirror descent and there's a relationship with the volatility. I didn't quite get that. But the, the, the liquidity. 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 Yeah. Sorry. So um, if you just think of uh, the way these stochastic gradient algorithms are used in, say, signal processing, um, you typically don't set the step size to go down with a schedule. I mean, it's a, it's a knob that you tune, tune mm -hmm. but the expectation is the algorithm will go down and jiggle around. And as long as it doesn't jiggle around too much, it's OK. Yeah, so. Do you have an intuition about the jiggling and the liquidity? <laughs> yes, I have some jiggling intuition. Right. Um, <laughs> so you can think of the, uh, the learning rate and the, the liquidity as sort of a friction parameter. And if you want, if you don't mind a lot of wiggling, then, and like you're taking an average, then sure, you don't really need the, this friction to go down to zero. Mm -hmm. But if you actually wanted your stochastic process to actually converge with, you know, and stop wiggling, and moreover converge to the right point, then you sort of have to set this very carefully. Right, but what is it, what, what, from a market perspective, why do you need that? Why is it the case that near enough isn't good enough? Um, you may want, to have more sensitivity to um, you know, very slight belief changes. Right. So in that case, you would want the amount of money that you could make for expressing a very slight deviation right. to be more. I see. But presumably, you still got the same intuition, which is the reason why the engineers don't let it go down to zero, in that the thing that it's adapting to may well change. The environment True. changes. True. True. That's true. The questions? Great, well, thanks okay. a lot, Raf. Um, yeah. uh, so it's time for a coffee break now, so you have.